uh, welcome you and to pass things off to our host, Susan Barker. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, this is our last uh, webinar for 2018, but there's more in star for next year, and so we hope you all have a happy holiday. And um, so I just want to run through my usual slides. This is you should join C2CC announce list. Uh, it's the best way to keep up with what we're doing. It's only for announcements. It's only used at the most three times a month, usually not. Um, and uh, am I on? Yes, OK. Um, and Facebook uh, and Twitter, you can follow us there, too. If you need help due to a disaster, this is the number 24-7 for the National Heritage Responders. They're very helpful. Um, and we used to have a forum, but the forum has moved, and we're now on the higher logic thing. So join it, and if you have questions, feel free to ask them. We're there to answer questions and to help you care for your collections. And you can always contact me. This is my email address. And I'm happy to solve problems. And so in January, our first um, webinar is on silica gel and microclimates. So be sure to turn in for that. That is currently posted. So if you want to sign up, you can. We're going to have a webinar on emergency planning for gardens in March, one on old loans uh, in April, uh, one on caring for herbaria in May. And there are more that are coming up. So uh, stay tuned. Look at the website. And we're having a course in uh, February and March on collections management for smaller institutions with, with uh, John Simmons. And then from March until June, we're having a longer course on reorg and uh, storage management. So uh, both of those should be posted soon. So. Uh, out for our ever-changing thing. And now I'm going to turn this over to um, Meg and Lisa, and we're going to have crating, boxing, basics. So thanks. And by the way, check out the video link below. It, it, their videos are great. So OK, bye-bye. Thanks, Susan. Uh, my name is Meg Colbert. I'm the director of production at BoxArt, which is a fine art packing and crating company located in Brooklyn. I've worked there since 1997, both as an art packer and now as the director of production, where I oversee the crate shop and the packing department. Um, and with me is Lisa Ludwig. Hi, I'm Lisa Ludwig. Um, I worked at BoxArt for 10 years. I worked in the art packing department. Um, now I'm currently a full-time visual artist. Um, so this webinar will provide you with a basic overview of some of the common methods and materials used when packing art and other objects. We hope to introduce you to some of the common vocabulary that you might encounter when dealing with a packing or creating project, and also give you some sense of what kind of questions to ask when you're going to pack your object for transit or for storage. At the end of the webinar, we will be answering your questions, so please feel free to ask us about anything you have questions or concerns about. So uh, the first step in any creating project is, determine, uh, is to determine the needs of your object. Uh, very basically, that is, what is your object made out of? What is its material? And then secondly, how is your crate going to be used? Is it going to be used for storage, or is your crate going to be used for traveling or for transit? Um, a lot of people might want to use their crate for both purposes. Um, why is there a difference? Well, the big difference is in the materials that you would be using in each of those applications. So the materials that you would use in a crate that you're going to use in transit are going to be a little bit different than the materials that you would use in a crate for storage. Um, you know, one thing to consider, too, when you're packing is uh, if it's going to travel, 
how many places is it going to travel to? That's a, a big consideration and a, something to think about when you're designing your packing solution. Um, so there's a big difference between storage and traveling crates, as we mentioned. Um, and the biggest thing that you're going to see that's different is the types of foam that you use. So when you're packing something for transit, one of the biggest concerns uh, and uh, issues that you're going to deal with is the changes in temperature that your crate is going to experience. That's because your crate might go outside, like on a loading dock or you know, at the airport on the tarmac in a warehouse on a truck. And so these changes in temperature are things that you want to mitigate by using a thermal insulating foam. And there are sort of three main types of foams that you see used in art crates. And these are U-foam, ester foam, and then polystyrene extruded foams. Uh, and these foams are generally dark gray, the U-foam and the ester foam. And then the polystyrene extruded foam looks a lot like the kind of foam that you can buy at Home Depot to insulate your house. Um, Another type of foam that you see used a lot is uh, shock absorbing foams for transit and storage, and that's ESSA foam, which is a white, white plank foam, uh, and it comes in various densities to support uh, different weighted weights of objects. And then another type of foam that you see is Bellara, which it tends to come in thinner sheetings, like eighth inch or quarter inch, and that's also a white closed celled foam. Um, so one of the biggest concerns in a storage situation is off-gassing. And ester foam, U-foam, and polystyrene foams all off-gas. And what this means is that as these foams age, they decay or break down, and they can uh, off-gas into the closed interior of the crate and possibly affect your object, um, which is why in a storage situation, uh, you don't want to put anything into a crate that is fully lined with ester foam or U-foam or polystyrene foam for more than 90 days. That's our general recommendation. Um, if you're storing something for longer, a longer period of time than that, you're going to want to use, if you need to use foam, a uh, ether foam, which is the white foam. Are there um, any other concerns besides just off-gassing? in a storage crate? Like, what are some of those issues? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest concerns in a storage situation is you need to be able to find your object. So if you are putting something into storage, you want to make sure that it's very easy to identify, either through labeling or uh, so that it's visible in some way. So maybe when you open your storage container, you can quickly visually inspect your object. And that's going to be pretty different than uh, the types of concerns that you have for transit in terms you might not be as concerned as being immediately able to uh, identify the object from the exterior of the crate. Um, in transit, your main concerns are really going to be vibration and shock. And um, just really briefly, I'm going to talk about vibration because it's a very complicated issue and there's a lot of uh, research going on about it right now, but I think that in terms of, uh, for the purpose of this webinar, uh, we could just say that there's a difference. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people think that vibration and shock are the same thing. What are the differences between the two? Yeah, and so the differences between vibration and shock in a very really layman's terms is that shock is a sort of singular event, like an impact. And vibration is that constant state of vibration that an object will experience, for example, on a truck or on an airplane. Uh, but what we're going to be talking about a little bit more is shock, which is uh, one of the ways that you can mitigate the effect of shock, like uh, your crate being dropped a little bit or uh, hit with another crate, is to use an appropriate type of foam and an appropriate amount of foam. Um, the big concern in transit really, though, is the temperature fluctuations. And uh, some people talk about this also in terms of like changes in humidity in the, in the environment inside the crate. But uh, most people's main concern is the actual drop in rays and temperature that these crates will 
go through. And so one of the ways that you mitigate that is by lining it in a thermal insulating foam. Uh, and then a big concern with the crate and transit is handling. What do you mean by handling? Well, mainly it's just how is somebody going to interact with your crate? How are they going to touch it? And uh, you know, as with all art packing and art crating, uh, you want to kind of encourage good handling, good safe handling. And you can do this in a variety of ways, but with your crate, you want to make sure that it has handles so that people don't tip it using a J-bar, for example, that they have a place to handle it safely. Um, you want it to have skids so that they're, if they are going to use a forklift or a, a pallet jack, that there's a place for it to fit underneath the crate. And uh, you know, clearly stencils with orientation stencils and any kind of uh, you know, directional stencils, ones that tell you what not to do, like don't leave this crate in the sun, don't leave this crate in the rain. Um, and then, you know, a really big concern with a crate that's traveling is uh, when it gets packed and unpacked. Um, the biggest concern in that situation is how clear the packing is the person who encounters it may not be aware completely of what object they are encountering. And so you want to make it really clear to them how to unpack and pack, repack the crate. And that can be achieved through, well, very good packing, but also diagrams and written instructions. Or yeah. sometimes um, if they're traveling to like another country or things like that, you may want to use symbols symbols instead of words so to like indicate where uh, packing material would be replaced. And you can always use photographs now that, uh, you know, it's pretty cheap and easy to print out photographs. And so taking a photograph of your finished packing solution is a good way to show someone how it should look when they need to repack it. Um, so first of all, we're going to sort of go into some specific packing methods. Yeah, so this is going to be for storage or transit. Correct. Sometimes, and um, we're starting with flat work. Um, I know this term is used a lot in the industry, but I feel like it needs to be clarified. Yeah, so when we're talking about flat works, we're mostly talking about framed works, like photographs or paintings or drawings that are in sort of regular frames. And uh, up here in this corner, and you can kind of see this little framed drawing. Uh, and so these objects are regular, uh, meaning that their shape is pretty uh, predictable and regular. And uh, so there's a, a relatively simple set of packing methods that are used to address their packing needs. And so one of those would be trays, which are uh, usually cardboard or foam core. And there you use these trays as dividers in between works, which allows you to pack multiple works of different sizes into the same crate um, without those objects touching each other. Um, um, we have videos um, like specifically with um, these packing works. Like we have a flat work tray packing. Um, we also have a shadow box. Um, these are little videos that we have that you can um, a little bit more of um, how they're made and the material. Yes, yeah, so if you want a little illustration of them, uh, maybe after the webinar you could watch uh, those videos. Um, another common method for packing is a travel frame. Um, is, a, is a travel frame used whenever um, the flat work isn't framed? Oh. Yeah, that's correct. And so basically when you're uh, you have an object like a canvas that doesn't have a frame. You don't want something to touch its face directly. Or maybe you have a flat work where it has a protrusion on the face, like a collage, or you know a, a combination uh, where someone has put you know maybe a, a sculptural element to on their flat work. Um, in that case, you want to provide a solution where you're not directly touching the artwork. Um, and in this case, we use travel frames or shadow boxes. Travel frames are called a lot of 
different things, but uh, what we're talking about is a wooden frame that you use to pack an artwork, usually with Oz clips, which is a type of hardware, um, which allows you you screw the Oz clip to the back of your artwork, and then you attach the Oz clip to the travel frame, thus avoiding having to touch the object with pads. Um, shadow boxes are sort of a simpler solution. It's a usually cardboard or foam core, and uh, we have, as Lisa was saying, a video of that up. But uh, these provide some of the protect protection of a travel frame. Um, you don't have to attach hardware to your artwork to use it. Um, and then the final way you might pack a flatwork would just be on its own in a crate um, using pads. Um, so to go a little bit more in depth into these packing methods, um, trays are a great solution if you want to consolidate a number of works into uh, into a single crate. Uh, there's two orientations that you can pack trays, and that's front loading or top loading. Front loading is when the object uh, is packed in the orientation that it would hang on the wall. Top loading is when an object is packed flat as though it were laying on a table. And uh, usually you would want to pack an object flat uh, if it was like an unframed work on paper or a pastel, charcoal, or graphite work. Uh, these generally should never ride in a front-loading orientation because the vibration from transit can cause the media to fall off the face of the paper. Um, books and portfolios are generally written in top loading trays. Uh, so trays can be made from multiple materials, uh, foam core, cardboard, or for storage, archival cardboard. And the pads are usually made of ethafoam, which is uh, the white foam that we were talking about earlier and is good as a storage solution. Um, I think we have illustrations of the front loading trays and top loading trays. So here, yeah, here we go, some illustrations. Uh, and so here what you're looking at are some uh, front loading trays. And you can see here you have three artworks of different sizes. And um, the crate is not shown. But what you're looking at here, too, is um, these are the pads. And these pads sort of line up with each other so that the pressure in the crate is transferred through the pads rather than through the artworks. Essentially, each tray is supported by the pads of the tray below it rather than by the artwork that is sitting on the tray. Here are some top loading trays. Generally, we always suggest that you do a full perimeter border of foam on a top loading tray. And this will uh, ensure that the artwork are sitting on, being supported by that foam rather than that pressure being uh, transferred to the object on the tray below it. Uh, and so then sometimes you have a single object. Yeah, this is a case of when it's just one piece. Sometimes you might just have a single object in a crate. Right, and so in that case, you could use a tray but um, you might not want to use that material. And so for transit, you could pack that work directly into the crate. And for storage, you could put it into an inner box, a box uh, with uh, ethafoam pads. Um, this could be a storage solution as well if you take the inner box out of the crate. Yeah, if you take the inner box out of the crate that's fully lined with uh, U-foam or ester foam. And so, uh, Sometimes you'll see objects will be riding directly against the U-foam or ester foam, um, but you wouldn't want to store that object in that crate. Uh, inner boxes, like you see in this image here, uh, they allow for the object to be held in place with ethafoam pads while still having the benefit of a fully lined crate here. And so what you would do with this situation is that you would remove this box from this crate to store it so that you would avoid uh, the off-gassing that would occur in that crate if you stored it with the box inside of it. Um, so hand space. 
Yeah, I think of hand space as a, a good way to indicate to where you want the work to be held, a good indicator. Yeah, like Lisa was mentioning earlier, uh, you know, you want to encourage safe handling. And one way to achieve this is uh, by providing people with places to put their hands to handle the artwork. Uh, you can see here on, this is an image of a top loading tray. And there's this little finger hole cut out. And this just encourages someone, instead of tilting the tray to get the artwork out or jamming their fingers in between the artwork and the foam, uh, to kind of safely handle it. And what you're looking at in this image of this crate here is uh, you have the crate fully lined with foam. And then pieces of foam are glued onto that full lining of foam with a void provided so that someone can stick their hands in there. And uh, this is really important because you want to make sure that uh, you've provided a place for someone to safely access the artwork. You don't want them to struggle to get it out of your packing solution. So just to go over travel frames a little bit more, uh, because they are a very common object. Uh, they're made out of wood, but you can have a travel frame that has no lid. It can have a lid usually made with uh, corrugated plastic, like coroplast, or it might just have wooden flats on the face. And um, these are handling tools that allow the object to be moved around um, without directly touching the object itself. And uh, usually, objects are mounted into these towel frames with odds clips or cleats or T-brackets. And uh, one of the benefits of a travel frame is that the object can be wrapped uh, in the object can be wrapped inside of the travel frame. So you wrap the travel frame in plastic, and you don't actually have to directly uh, contact the object itself with the plastic. So here's an image of a little drawing diagram of an Ozclip, which is a common hardware solution that you see. And they, are, they fold up so that you attach one side to your artwork. You usually use them in fours. Uh, so you attach one side to your artwork. You fold out the leg, and that leg is what gets attached to the travel frame. So the travel frame uses Ozclips, and the box uses pads? Correct. So the biggest uh, is vocabulary lesson to take out of this is that a travel frame is a distinct object from a box. And so it's good to clarify these things. A lot of confusion can be avoided if you make it clear what you want done to your artwork. So whether you're building these objects yourself or you're asking a crater to build them, you should indicate what you want to use this object for. And I'm talking about travel frame or inner box. Travel frames are called various things throughout the industry. Um, I've encountered them being called handling frames or traveling boxes. Um, we call them travel frames at our company, um, and that's kind of common in New York. But uh, the most important thing to indicate would be that you want to mount your object into this frame using Oz clips or cleats. Um, so shadow boxes, uh, they're a good sort of soft packing alternative to a travel frame. Uh, if you don't have a shop, like a wood shop, this is a, a kind of easy way to protect an object that has a, a protrusion or sensitive surface. Um, you can use hand tools to make them. And these can be packed on trays or in boxes or in crates. Exactly. So you basically, this would also be a handling tool that you can use. So instead of uh, directly touching the artwork, you now can wrap the shadow box. You can pack the shadow box onto the tray. Um, so now we're going to move into three-dimensional objects, which, of course, all objects are three-dimensional. Yeah, what do you mean by three-dimensional objects? We, we generally, this is something that we kind of try to to make a, a distinction between flatworks and 3D, 3D objects, um, it's really just you know vocabulary. But um, what we consider a three-dimensional object or sculpture is uh, something that kind of exists in the round that is generally not hung on a wall. Although obviously with contemporary art, there are a lot of exceptions to these rules. 
Um, but these are generally more complex objects uh, that require more complex packing solutions. So what you're looking at on this slide is a, an image of a, a crate that has an inner box that has a sculpture inside of it. Um, just really basic overview. Uh, there are some typical types of packing that are used for sculpture. You have simple pad packing, you have cavity packing, and you have brace packing. Maybe you've, um, like in the next um, slide, there's um, simple pad packing for sculpture. Um, maybe you've seen a crate like this where the object just slides in or out. It's a single object. Um, there are no other parts except for the pads glued straight into the crate. Correct. And so this is something that you could do if your object had a generally sort of regular surface, sort of like a cube, where you don't have big voids that need to be supported. Um, the reason you can just use pads in this situation is because those pads are going to have a relatively low profile, meaning they don't have to be 16 inches deep to hit the artwork. Um, in general, uh, your pads are going to be made out of ethafoam, and uh, they will have some kind of interleaving material applied to the surface, such as Tyvek or Valara. Um, that's not always the case. Some people will simply wrap their ob object rather than wrap the pads, and a lot of this just depends on maybe your institution's preferences, uh, the you know the, the character of your artwork itself. So some artworks you don't want to wrap in plastic because maybe they have fragile surfaces that the plastic could pull on. Um, but uh, these are com this, is, this would be a common treatment for pads would be to wrap the pads themselves. Um, So the next type of very common sculpture packing that you see is brace packing. And what you're looking at in this not terribly great <laughs> photograph is a bronze figure, a life-size statue. Uh, I've blacked it out for privacy's sake. But uh, what you're looking at are it's being held down and in place with wooden braces that have pads attached to them. Uh, the braces are kind of like what I like to think of as like a kitchen drawer where it like goes in and out, so it's sliding in That's to right. place. And so you can have uh, a couple types of braces. They could be tracked in, so they have tracks that they slide on, like Lisa was saying. Or they could be screwed in, which is also really common. Um, if you have an object that's going to be traveling a bunch of times in the same crate, Track braces are a really great way to ensure that it gets packed the same exact way every time. Um, because when you screw a brace in, the screw holds bore out. Um, it's really up to the person who's reinstalling it to put it in the correct place. So there's more places for error and uh, change in the packing. Um, you want to use this kind of packing if your object kind of has a irregular shape or delicate surface. Um, one thing that is a benefit with brace packing is that you, you can touch the object as little as possible. So you can kind of hold it in place as though you were holding an object in place with your fingers as opposed to grabbing it with your hands. And um, this is ideal. You want to, in general, default to a packing method that involves touching the artwork as little as possible. Um, every time you touch an artwork, uh, it shortens its lifespan. Every time you handle an artwork, it shortens its lifespan. So um, with good packing, you want to make sure that uh, you are interacting with the surface as little as possible. Um, you want to always choose areas that are uh, you know, the safest place to touch it. So if you have an area that is made up of very fragile fibers, for example, you wouldn't hold that down there. You would try to hold it down by the bronze area. Um, you want to make sure to, if your piece has, if there's an alternative to holding it on its surface, for example, if your piece has mounting hardware, that's a great way to hold your object in place um, while uh, 
basically minimizing uh, contacting the surface of the piece. And so what I'm talking about with mounting hardware is if you have an object that screws onto a pedestal, something like that, you can often use those mounting holes to uh, hold the object in place. It wouldn't be the only way that you held the object in place necessarily, but it could provide a lot of that um, stability in the crate. In this uh, slide, you have a pad at the top, and that's because you went with a sculpture. So you're basically trying to approach the sculpture so it doesn't spin, right. it doesn't really move. You want to make sure that you're holding this object down so it's not, it can't jump up, uh, and then side to side uh, and front and back. And um, here you can see uh, that this object is uh, it's a female figure. It's being held down by her shoulders and then on her head. And then it's being held side to side on the hips and on the legs. And then probably not very visible here, but she's got pads all around holding her feet in place. Um, just to go to talking about handling a little bit, sometimes you have an object that's very, very heavy or very, very fragile. And you don't really want to touch it directly too much. And when it's very heavy, one of the reasons might be that it's, it's heavy, but it's not uh, big enough to have the number of people hold it at the same time. It's necessary to lift its weight. Um, well, well, here again, the sculpture tray could be a good way to encourage safe handling. Yeah, and so a sculpture tray is basically it's a plank of wood, usually MDO. Um, sometimes it will have uh, interleaving material attached to it, like HDPE, which is a, a rigid plastic. HDPE obviously comes in many forms. It comes in sheeting, but it comes in a, in a board, basically, that you can use. Uh, and uh, you put the object, as seen in this image on the left, you put the object on the tray, and then you lift the tray. And this way, you avoid overhandling the object, and it can just also provide a structure if you needed to forklift or pallet jack the object into the crate. Could this be a storage solution as well? Yeah. I mean, this is, a, this is really common where people will have their object packed a lot on, the, on a sculpture tray, so a lot of the packing will have been done on the tray, meaning your braces will be screwed down to the tray. And then the tray will be removed from the crate for storage, um, you know, and the object might be draped with plastic or something, but it provides kind of a, a storage and handling solution that can be a really uh, easy way to move the object around. Um, just to reiterate with braces, um, braces can be screwed or tracked in, which means tracks are basically you've provided, like this was saying like a kitchen drawer, you've provided a, a track for it to run on so that it will always go back in the same place. Um, if you're screwing in your braces, it's a good idea to clearly mark where those braces go so that the person on the other end, when they're repacking your object, um, doesn't have to make a lot of decisions because you want to be in control of the decisions that you're making with packing. Um, be really clear, something that you see a lot with bad packing is someone is using a brace pack method but they're allowing the wood of the brace to directly touch the object. And you should never do that. You always want a pad to be in between the wood and the object. And I know this sounds um, very intuitive, but it is surprisingly not. You don't want a piece of wood up against your art object or whatever type of object you're packing. So always make sure that you have an interleaving material in between the wood in your object. And usually that's going to be ethyfoam, although it could be Valara um, on top of ester foam, depending on the characteristics of your object. Um, and then uh, one thing that you might want to watch out for uh, is uh, burnishing, which happens when a pad basically shines up a little area of your artwork. Usually it happens on stone or bronze. And this can be uh, avoided if you drape your artwork in a material like soft Tyvek or Dartec, and then wrap your pads as well in a material like uh, Tyvek tape or 
plastic, something like that. So another very, very common packing method that you will see is uh, cavity packing. And cavity packing is a, a great solution for very fragile objects. Yeah, I have um, handled some um, baskets that were really fragile that cavity packing was perfect for or for like really fragile masks. Right. Something that um, maybe can't stand on its own that needs just a, a nice place to rest mm -hmm. or maybe something really fragile like glass or ceramic. Yeah. Um, cavity packing is really great for that. Yeah, and this would be an alternative to like tissue packing something. Um, the What you do basically is usually using ester foam or U foam, you would cut the contour of the shape out of that foam. And we have a video up, actually, we have a couple videos up on that link that show a cavity pack being done. Um, the foam is cut out to contour the shape of the object. And I know that previously I said with brace packing, you want to touch the object as little as possible, but sometimes it's just not feasible. And, uh, what a cavity pack does in a situation is, instead of providing a point of pressure to hold an object in place, it disperses that pressure throughout the cavity. Uh, and, you know, this can be a good way to minimize shock that, for example, a glass object would experience if, uh, if the crate experienced shock. So um, the foam absorbs the shock. Yeah, it, it lessens the shock. And uh, here's an image of uh, this piece is not particularly fragile. It's a marble bust of a person. Um, but like Lisa was saying, it couldn't stand on its own. So if you tried to stand this up on the table, it would just flop over. And because of the carving, you don't want to see that happen. So the best way we could figure to pack something like this was in a cavity where it's supported from underneath. And uh, it's not... Uh, you know, it could have been, had a brace pack as well, but this is just a kind of simpler method of doing that. And because it's uh, stone, uh, which can shatter in certain circumstances, uh, the cavity provides a shock prote protection against that. Here, again, um, my favorite, safe handling of objects. Um, the hand spaces are like indicators to help the person on the other end that's unpacking and handling the art to know the best areas to actually touch the work, the less, the least fragile, or um, where the surface is like um, easier to to handle. Yeah, and so I mean that's a really good point where just to reiterate, you want to really lead people to how you want them to touch your art. You want to give them very few chances to be creative. You want them to kind of follow your direction. And if you're not going to be there to tell them verbally how to touch something, you can give them indications. And so providing hand space is a great way to show someone how they should handle your object. Um, as an aside, uh, you can uh, line a cavity in usually Usually soft Tyvek is a preferred material, although some institutions uh, don't like it because uh, it has a surface texture, which uh, in some circumstances could transfer to an object, although it's a very common material. And so some people use uh, muslin instead, or you know, Teflon is another material. Um, and I see... Uh, a question about adhesive here in the parking lot that I'm just going to address really quick, although we are going to answer all these questions after the, uh, after the webinar is over. But um, generally, the adhesives that are used to attach pads to wood is a uh, hot melt glue. Uh, 3M makes a hot melt, melt glue that uh, is considered archival to pass audit tests. Um, so, that would be, I would suggest, going through 3 website and taking a look at their hot melt adhesive. Um, and uh, wrapping a pad in material, you can, uh, you can use glue, again, to wrap the pad. It takes a little practice and can be quite frustrating. But 
uh, it's definitely doable. And some um, some have it. He's a yeah. You can uh, I believe that through uh, university products you can find self adhesive Tyvek tape. Well, with this cavity packing um, slide, is something like this could you use it for storage? Um, you know, yes and no. Like you're obviously using ester foam, which is not great. So it depends on the composition of your object. I would say for most ceramic and glass, you're probably not as concerned about off-gassing as you would be with a painting, for example. Um, but again, you really have to kind of think about the, the materials that you're packing, meaning the art materials. Um, so it, as an alternative, you could soft pack this, maybe using archival tissue or even uh, pillows made with batting something like that. Um, so one thing that I just like to remind people is that there is more than one way to pack a crate. And so even though there are standard methods for packing, um, you shouldn't feel constrained to only use one. Every object is unique. And so you may have a situation where uh, the bottom half of your object really requires a cavity pack but the top is a complete, uh, you know, completely fragile with little spindly things that are sticking off, and it would really require a brace pack. So you can do both. Um, it's, you should be open to mixing solutions where it's appropriate. And uh, you know, just keep in mind there's no one side size fits all approach to packing, especially when you're dealing with art objects. Uh, Every object is unique, and you should approach it as such. Think outside the box. <laughs> so a box can be open from the top and the side or the front? That's correct. So um, that's what you're seeing in this drawing here. And um, the reason that you might want that is because, for example, here you have this object being cavity packed. These are layers of foam. So it's being cavity packed on the bottom and then brace packed on the top, and uh, you know, it's a, it's basically top loading. But you want to be able to access and see what you're doing, so it's also front loading. And so you should really think about how you want someone to access your object. And generally, you don't want someone to have to reach into any packing solution in an awkward way. You want it to be a comfortable to lift out of the box. And so for a top-loading box, that would mean you don't want to make it too deep. And for a front-loading box, again, you wouldn't want to make it too deep. So whatever uh, orientation, the lid or the front of the box, whatever it comes off, it should really encourage someone to be able to get that object out of the container easily. So a top-loading box could be loaded in a front-loading crate. Yeah, that's, a, that's um, definitely something that you can do. So like, let's say you had multiple objects uh, going into top-loading boxes. You could put those top-loading boxes into a front-loading crate, and that might allow you to put more boxes in the same crate. Um, you don't, it's good to just kind of think about these things, like, that there isn't just one approach. and. Uh, you know, mixing orientations with your inner components and your outer components, that's acceptable as long as it's safe, meaning that it you don't have to do any sort of weird movement to get the object out of the crate. You want to minimize that. You want to make it easy to remove the object or the um, inner component, the inner box or travel from. You want to make it easy to remove that object out of the crate. Um, so soft packing, which um, in our experience is sort of a mixed bag in a lot of ways. Uh, I think Lisa and I both have a lot of experience uh, unpacking soft packed objects. Um, but generally, soft packing refers to when you pack an object maybe using tissue or bubble um, for short-term short transit solutions, very common. So like, think about how you would uh, move something from your storage facility to your museum, you might just pack it in tissue in a cardboard box and, and you know, bring it over in a truck. Uh, soft packing really can be a place where 
some bad things happen, though. <laughs> well, things can um, get lost if it's not labeled properly yeah. or not really being sure of how many pieces or if it's not labeled, you might not know how many pieces are in the box. Right. Um, you might um, you might have a piece wrapped in tissue that you can't see because you've wadded so much tissue into that box that it's not clear what's the object and what's the packing material. These are all really common concerns with soft packing. Uh, I think the biggest issue that you see with soft packing is objects getting lost in the packing material and then being mishandled because the soft packing was not labeled clearly. And when we're talking about labeling, you want to label it so that, again, you're encouraging good handling. So if it must always ride in a vertical orientation, you should definitely write that on your soft packing, even if you're only putting it into storage. Um, you don't know who's going to encounter your object next and what their uh, impulse is going to be when they see this object. They might not stop to think, hey, how do I handle this? So you should tell them through clear labeling or you know, stickers that go on it with arrows or whatnot. Um, I even think um, it's a good idea to, if it's going to travel to different locations, to indicate not to throw away yeah. the materials. Because sometimes people, when they're unpacking um, soft pack, they might just kind of toss the packing materials. So it's important to even let them know to keep it all together. Yeah, I think that's a really, really important point because you see that happen a lot where people have soft packed uh, works for transit and somebody throws away the archival tissue and then the person repacking it just repacks it without the archival tissue. It's a problem. Um, I think speaking of archival tissue and that uh, one other really common place for damage in soft packing is people threading material through the void in your object. And so what I'm talking about is imagine a uh, jug that has a handle. Uh, that handle, you would never lift that jug from that handle as an art handler uh, because it's probably the weakest part of that object. Um, and just in the same way, you would never put packing material through that handle because it's going to it may cause someone to pull the packing material and put pressure on that thing. And so you see this a lot when people are packing, uh, you know, jugs with handles, uh, glassware. And then often with chandeliers, people will thread material through the chandelier um, in a way that encourages them to sort of pull the material of the chandelier off. Uh, so what you want to do in those situations is um, really wrap things in a clear way without threading things through. So you can stabilize the object without threading material through it. Something else to add, if you're soft packing for storage, you might want to avoid using tape as much as possible. Yeah, tapes um, in general, the adhesives on tapes break down and uh, you see two things happening generally. Either the adhesive on the tape dries out and your tape no longer sticks to the surface of whatever it's taping, or uh, it breaks down and it becomes super sticky and the adhesive will stay on your packing material when you remove the tape. And both of these indicate a chemical change in that adhesive, which could be affecting the environment of your storage container. Um, just as an aside, a really common place for damage is uh, people using tape in a soft packing situation and accidentally, because of all the material that they're using, they tape the tape gets on the surface of the object. So that's something to be aware of and to avoid. Um, and, you know, just again, clear labeling. Label the number of objects that is in your soft packing solution. So if you have a cardboard box with 32 objects in it, that should definitely be written somewhere on that box that there are 32 objects in that box. So we've talked a lot about the interior packing of crates. Um, and so I'm just going to do a really, really brief overview of uh, sort of the exterior crate. Uh, so this diagram, which shows sort of a cross-section of a crate where you see the rain cap, and that's basically you want 
a piece of wood flat on the top of your crate. And what that does is, like its name suggests, is if your crate happens to be in inclement weather, it could be even be for a brief period of time, you don't want rainwater or uh, snow or whatever pooling on the surface of your crate. And so a rain cap basically encourages the water to shed off the top of the crate. Um, end blocks provide structure uh, to the crate, so your crate should have that. It basically protects it from impact. Uh, skin, if you talked about it, or a J-bar or a pallet jack or a, a forklift blades, um, which you may not want your crate to be forklifted. But again, uh, unfortunately, if you're not with your crate in a courier capacity, it's likely that it will be at the airport. Um, handles provide, a, encourage people to use use uh, the handles as opposed to like tilting the crate in an awkward way, uh, especially if your crate is heavy, this is really important. Your handles can be made out of metal um, or they can, it can be a piece of wood too, which is very common. And then gasket, which is uh, another protection against inclement weather. Gasket, like the gasket that you might see around your windows in your house to prevent moisture from getting in. This is the same kind of thing. It's a rubber, rubberized gasket. Um, that provides a seal that prevents moisture from getting into the crate. So this is obviously um, a crate for transit. What's the difference between a crate for transit and a crate for storage? Well, the first thing is that you wouldn't need a rain cap because, well, hopefully your storage solution is not going to have a lot of water flowing everywhere. Um, and then in terms of end blocks and skids, you might not need those either because you're going to be uh, you're, you could probably have an inner box as opposed to a crate. So uh, it's a much simpler construction that doesn't require um, the reinforcement of these elements uh, to protect the structure. Because one thing to remember with a crate for transit is that it's going to be moved around a lot. So it's not just like a piece of furniture where it just sits there. Like this is something that gets tilted and moved and put on dollies. And so you want it to really, really have a strong uh, structure that will hold together during all these things. Um, for an inner box, you don't really require that as much because it's not going to face as much handling in the same way. Um, so we're just going to kind of finish up uh, with a couple of issues to consider and then some recommendations. Uh, so this is a really common, my favorite, common, uh, maybe not super common, but it, it happens. And when it happens, it is so upsetting. But you always want to make sure that your crate is going to fit through the doorway or into the elevator of the place that it's going to. Um, it's the worst where you build a crate for an object, and it is too tall to fit in the institution's door or too wide to fit in their elevator. And um, it's a real pickle for the art handlers on the other end. And you know, no one's happy when that happens to you. So you know, those are questions that you want to ask. Do you have a loading dock? Uh, how tall is your door? How wide is your door? What are the internal dimensions of an elevator that if the crate has to ride on a freight elevator, for example? And always be available to give that information, too. Um, if you are hiring somebody to do something for you, they might not ask, so go ahead and measure out your doorways, your elevators, and have it sitting by your computer. Yeah, I think if you're if you're responsible for creating uh, specifications for creating for your institution, that's a, a really good thing to have on hand. That you can just have a little packet where you say, "I want my crates 100% of the time if they're traveling to be lined in ester foam." Um, our loading dock is 92 inches tall, so we have a height restriction of 92 inches on all crates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one other really common thing that you see, uh, is, and when I say common, meaning common among the rare problems, is uh, tip risks. So crates that are like really tall and skinny, uh, they are more likely to fall over. That's pretty obvious when you think about it, um, one of the ways that you can counter this is by creating a minimum footprint. So for example, we would suggest that any crate over 60 inches 
be at least 12 inches wide, 12 to 15 inches wide. Um, when you have a crate that's under a certain width, it gets real floppy and it's, it's prone to tip over, especially when somebody tries to put it onto a dolly. Another thing to consider that people often don't think about is how heavy is your crate. If it's really, really heavy, it might require one, sort of a different construction plan for the crate itself, but also you might want to provide a way to handle it, like it should have a place for forklift blades so that it can be forklifted, or um, you might want to stencil the crate that is very, very heavy so that basically it protects the people who are going to be handling the crate, but it also protects your object from having people frustrated and trying to lift something that they can't lift. So we'll just finish out with some recommendations. Uh, this is something that we do all the time. Uh, we like to record our successful packing solutions and our unsuccessful ones. Uh, you know, you might encounter the same object 10 times and pack it differently every time. And it might only be until the 10th time that you really arrive at the best solution. Um, there's no one answer to a lot of this stuff. So it's really important that you keep track of what works and what doesn't. Um, you should really focus on uh, clear communication in the form of clear packing instructions or diagrams. I always say this, but I like to imagine the least experienced user, and that's my kind way of saying you might have someone who you don't really want handling your art, handling your art. So you give them as much information as possible so that you are, even if you're not there, you are effectively telling them how to treat your art. Um, I think one thing to think about is you should always be open to new approaches to packing your object. Uh, you know, there are new materials and methods that are constantly being talked about, and some of them are very good solutions. Um, but you should always put the safety of your object first. Uh, you know, they, you shouldn't really experiment with your objects uh, if you're not sure that it's going to work. Um, and then we always say uh, you shouldn't store your objects in crates that are fully lined with thermal insulating foam. Uh, that's just a general rule. Uh, Off-gassing really does uh, damage and affect an object. And then, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing is talk through your, uh, your object, ask questions. What is it made out of? What kind of, you know, what kind of material would be best to uh, work with this object? Every object is unique, and you should treat it accordingly. So, you know, don't just take a cookie cutter approach to packing. Really think about each object as it's presented to you, even if you're dealing with a lot of similar objects. Um, and so, I think that's our hour. And so, I'm going to go through some of the questions that are up here that we. Uh, here. So what about polyethylene foam? Uh, so polyethylene foam is actually just ethafoam. So that's the white foam that I was talking about. Um, there's a couple poles that are being put up right now. Uh, we're just kind of interested to see what everybody is mostly concerned with here. And it looks pretty even so far. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Transport and storage. Um, so, second question here is, uh, please comment on the different grades of ethafoam. Uh, so, just in general, uh, I'm just going to put, put out there that there's a great organization that talks about materials. It's called PACCIN, P-A-C-C-I-N. It's Preparation Art Handling Collection Care Information Network. And they have a really nice uh, materials index. Um, just something that you could access later. Uh, just, I'm just uh, throwing that out there so as a resource. And um, but uh, to talk about ethafoam, uh, I know white ethafoam has no colorants, and so uh, and black, there's black ethafoam as well, which uh, I believe has passed Audi tests. But a general rule of thumb with uh, uh, 
plastics, um, like polyethylene foam or chloroplast, is that it's more likely to pass eye tests if it doesn't have a coloring agent in it. So uh, generally, you're going to want to use the white ethafoam. Um, an another distinction of ethafoams is uh, densities of ethafoams. So you, you'll hear 4.0, 2.2, 9.0. These are all different densities that can handle a different weight rating. Which foams would be used for storage? So again, ethafoam or the polyethylene foam is what you would want to use in a storage crate. And you would want to avoid using the U-foam or ester foams, which are urethane foams. And they're the gray. They're the gray foams. Um, or the polystyrene foam, which is the kind of foam that you see at Home Depot to line your house uh, for insulation. That foam also you would want to avoid to use in a storage crate. Um, so the next question here is, if I have a crate that used to hold three paintings, but I want to use it for only one of the three for an outgoing one, what should I be worried about when retrofitting? Um, well, the first thing that you're going to want to worry about is uh, holding your object in place. You want to make sure that uh, whatever pads are in that crate uh, hold that object so that it's not moving and there's no extra space around it. A good way to uh, do this would be to make a tray out of cardboard or foam core and uh, put pads on it that build up the difference of the missing art bricks. But you want to make sure that your object is also held in place so that side to side and top to bottom it's still held in place in the crate. But basically making a dummy tray is a good way to fill out that extra space. And when retrofitting, be sure to let the handler on the other end know that there's only one object, one object. <laughs> and not um, like two that randomly disappeared. Yeah, you don't want to give them a heart attack. That's uh, just a courtesy. Um, the next question, how can I pack and ship multi-panel acrylic paintings on two-inch cradle clay, oh, cradled clay board? The panels are unframed with no hanging hardware. So this is a really kind of um, difficult situation. A shadow box actually would be a really good situ uh, solution in this uh, situation. And uh, that, that would probably be the safest way. And I guess you could wrap the uh, pads with Tyvek. Yeah, you, depending on if you could touch the face of it, you would, might want to use, say, foam wrapped in Tyvek or maybe um, wrapped in Dartec or Valara, something like that. Um, it's a way to hold it down in the, uh, in the shadow box, which you can see in, in the video, actually. One of the videos we have shows a shadow box being used that way. Um, how can, oops, sorry. So is polystyrene chemically safe for objects? Well, I think for a short-term solution it is. I've read conflicting uh, opinions on this. I think it off-gasses, uh, so, uh, and it produces dust. So you know when you punch a piece of styrofoam or the polystyrene foam, it actually breaks down. It doesn't recover, which is an argument against using it because basically um, when, it, when it experiences impact, it, it doesn't return. It just breaks. So with U-foam or ester foam, if you punch that U-foam, it returns like a mattress. Um, so, uh, but in terms of its chemical composition, I think it should be treated like um, the uh, like ester foam or U-foam as a material that you wouldn't want to store an object around for more than 90 days. And I would be really hesitant to have it contact an object directly, to be perfectly honest. Um, would coloring and artwork also be the same as using shadow box? Yep, that's exactly the same thing. How do you attach the Tyvek to the pad? Well, you can wrap it like a present. <coughs> uh, you can wrap it like a present, or uh, you can use a self-adhesive Tyvek tape, which I believe is sold on university products. Um, often when you wrap a pad, um, we might make a little incision on the back and tuck it in 
So um, then when you glue the pad onto the crate or onto the cardboard, it's also um, touching the Tyvek too, so it all stays in place um, for the duration of the travel. Yeah. Um, so could you use Epifoam for cavity packing and then have the pack <clears throat> for long-term storage? Uh, you could, I, I would suggest only if the objects were sort of heavy and robust. Um, I've done it before for different clients. Um, the, the thing with ester foam or e-foam is that it's a real cushion. So if you were going to use ethafoam as a cavity, uh, you just have to be aware that it's a much more rigid foam, and so it's not going to provide that cushioning. Um, as an alternative, I would suggest using, um, you know, sort of like making pillows or something like that, which you could also use, or lining your ethafoam cavity with, uh, you know, poly batting lined with muslin or Tyvek, something like that. Uh, so what material, oh wait, what kind of adhesives are you using to attach ethafoam? So I think I went over this a little bit in the webinar, but we use a hot milk glue. Um, we, uh, that's a stable material that we would recommend. And then what materials do you suggest for the ring caps? This should just be a plywood. Um, we use MDO, but any plywood would work. It's better if it has um, sort of the facing on it, which is a sort of waterproof facing. So, you know, with pilots, you can see those ones that sort of are composite boards where you can see on the surface it's a composite board. That might not be the best material for a rain cap. You probably want one that has like a smooth surface that has a sort of waterproofing. Also, um, painting can make it waterproof a bit as well, like a poly or paint um, can help. Right, so um, often people will paint their crates for two reasons. It provides a little bit of uh, weatherproofing, but it also makes your crate really easy to identify in a warehouse or in an airport tarmac situation, um, which could be very important if you're uh, shipping something of high value. Um, so what do you use for the gasket? Uh, we use a rubberized gasket. It's, it's basically uh, the kind of gasket that you might line your window with uh, for is a moisture barrier. Um, I will look more into the specifics of that. But you can usually get this at hardware stores if you're in a pinch. Or um, I, I'm not sure. Steve? Uh, I used to go to the National Rubber I think it's Jacobs and Jacobs. Oh, Jacobs and Jacobs yeah. is, the, is our distributor for that gas gasket. Uh, sorry, I was uh, phoning in for some help from are a very good coworker. Uh, so what about insurance for transit? Well, that's uh, that's a, a big uh, thing. It depends on your institution. So your insurance should generally be carried through your institution, or it's possible that, um, for example, if you are borrowing a piece, maybe the lender will be paying for that part of the process. Um, but that's really dependent institution to institution, or sometimes you can purchase insurance through your crating company. Um, but that's all dependent on your own situation. And so here we have uh, what type of 3M hot milk passes the audio test? Are there other adhesives you recommend for inside crates and cases? Um, well, the 3M hot milk that passes the eye test is actually listed on the conservation wikia that has the eye test uh, materials. And unfortunately, I don't know it off the top of my head. But um, <clears throat> because it's a basic, uh, uh, it's uh, one of their big sellers. It's for the industrial 3M large orange glue guns. Uh, I will. I'm going to try to enter that information later if I figure it out. Um, the product number <laughs> is 3292Q on the 3M website um, that we use, which uh, we have certified has passed audit tests. Uh, so 
Another material that you could use inside crates would be a spray glue called somalfa, um, which is something that you spray on using pneumatic hoses, and uh, that also is acceptable. Uh, so what you're talking about here, the polyethylene thin foam, oh, you're probably talking about microfoam. Uh, let me click the link. I'm afraid to click the link because I don't want to interrupt the thing. But I'm pretty sure that what you're talking about is microfoam. Uh, and okay, uh, that also is basically it's epiphone. It's just in a thinner form, and people use it a lot to, in a, as a soft packing uh, material. Uh, so that would be the same material, and also it's, it's fine. So I work for a transportation museum, and many of the items we have to pack for storage and shipping have oil or other viscous fluids inside of them. It's not always possible, advisable to fully drain and clean them. Any recommendations for protecting the crate itself or things on the outside of the crate from seepage and leakage? Ah, that's a terrible problem. Uh, well, it's also not that uncommon. Um, one, the, the simplest thing to do would be to uh, wrap the object itself in plastic and make sure that it's sealed. Uh, and then invest in maybe an inner box that is lined in plastic so that that seepage doesn't affect the rest of the crate. And you'd want to kind of keep it separated by wrapping it in plastic or putting it in a plastic lined box, um, separate it so that it doesn't affect the foam in the crate. Yeah, and so, sorry, we just, uh, got the link up, and that is a microphone. Totally fine to use. Uh, it's basically just a different dimension, dimensional uh, uh, SFO. Um, and so like another thing with uh, any objects that have stuff, like liquids and stuff, um, you want to make sure, too, when you're shipping that, that it's uh, you know safe to ship in terms of if it's a flammable material or something like that, you really uh, don't want to get into a situation where you're putting uh, the airline at risk or something by shipping something that could be combustible. Uh, so this question is, uh, we have historic scientific instruments, uh, sextants and quadrants with their original travel cases. Would you trust to packing the instrument in those cases, or would you advise packing instruments in cases separately? Well, it depends on how the internal packing in those uh, boxes has held up. If it's still in relatively good shape, I would say that's fine. You could always kind of add to it with a little uh, archival tissue if needed, but probably that's going to be a pretty safe solution. And also, because the box now is kind of like a flat work, uh, it's much easier to pack onto a tray. So it can kind of speed up uh, the packing. And also, the box provides a nice handling tool so that not too many people are handling the actual fragile object of a sextant or the quadrant. Um, I'm concerned about the off-gassing of plywood crates. Any recommendations for an interior barrier lining? Yeah, uh, one there's a couple of uh, types of moisture barriers that people use. Uh, probably the most common one is marble seal film. And uh, this is something that you would line the inside of your crate with, and it acts. It's an aluminized uh, sort of plastic that uh, you heat activated uh, material that you iron onto the inside of your crate, and it protects the interior environment from off-gassing. Uh, that's probably the most common one. Uh, you could line the interior of your crate uh, with, sometimes people might line it with a Tyvek and stuff, but it's definitely not as effective. Um, one thing that I would say with marble seal is be aware that when you puncture it, it's no longer effective. So. Uh, if you're attaching pads to it, you don't want to cut away the film, which a lot of people do so that the glue will adhere directly to the wood. You're going to want to glue right onto that marble seal. And just be aware that it's really easy to puncture or tear, but you can patch it. So um, 
basically we just iron on patches. But it does require some upkeep, and uh, it is time consuming and pretty expensive to apply to the interior of a crate. So if you were looking for a storage solution to avoid that, you might want to consider um, using a different material, like making your box uh, with coroplast walls or something like that, it's just for storage, not for transit. Um, coroplast, you know, I mean, that's a good question. I would say, you know, like in terms of using it inside of a crate as a, as a barrier, I'm not really sure. But I think that if you used it instead of the plywood, that would be probably a pretty good solution, which you could do by basically creating a frame out of wood and then lining the interior of that frame with uh, the coroplast. Um, and yeah, marble seal is really expensive and nobody likes to apply it. It's probably one of the least favorite materials of anybody who has to build a crates or objects because it's just very finicky and uh, very time consuming to apply. Um, Looks like all the questions for now. So I mean, I guess we can stick around for a little bit if people have any more questions. Uh, There's one on DARTEC, but there are a couple more coming up. OK. We have a couple more coming up. Yeah, I, um, Sarah Dunn, I put in a link to our webinar that we did last spring on care of industrial objects because there was some discussion about moving them, putting them into storage. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that you always want to be aware of with those types of objects is that, uh, you know, that moving them obviously can cause seepage and spillage of those materials. But you also want to be aware of whether those materials are toxic for the environment whether you need to segregate them from your other objects in your collection, and whether you need to maybe inform you know, the fire department that you might have climbable objects somewhere in your facility, uh, just as a, a little side, side note. Um, yeah, and there are rigging companies that, that specialize in moving industrial objects from museums. And I think there's uh, some of them are listed in that webinars handout. Um, so here's another question. Uh, have you ever seen DARTEC leave a white powdery residue on an object? We had this come up uh, on the frame of a painting with wrapped in DARTEC and cavity packed to white flat. I'm not sure if the white substance came from the DARTEC abrading or if it could be something from the wool. It easily brushed off, but just wondering if you had ever seen this. Um, I have not, actually. I haven't seen that. Um, but I, how long was it left in the cavity pack? Because it could be an issue with off-gassing affecting the object inside of the DARTEC. Um, I have seen objects that were left wrapped in plastic um, inside fully lined crates, crates lined with ester foam, and they were left in there for two years. And the uh, basically, the varnish on the frames reactivated, like became uh, sticky and viscous. Um, and that was from off, the off-gassing in the crate. Um, but I would say that it sounds more like it could be from the I mean, dark tech is very smooth, so generally I would say that it wouldn't abrade anything. It's, uh, it, that's almost its selling point, is that it's a very slick, smooth material that provides few hard corners or resistance uh, as a surface. So I would say that probably it sounds more like maybe an off-gassing issue, but it could I'm not sure. Um, so here, uh, are you using original travel boxes for scientific equipment. I made a personal purchase of second-hand microscope equipment that was shipped in its original travel boxes. The rigid green foam that was originally used to support and protect the equipment disintegrated from vibration and shock during transit. And I received loose objects covered in green powder. Oh, it's terrible. But yes, I mean, a lot of foam 
uh, as they age, they basically they, they will powderize. And uh, it's something to consider. One thing is I, I suggest to anybody who has to deal with traveling art is that be aware of how long uh, your object is, how old your foam and your crate is. Uh, you know, for example, with ester foam, after 10 years, the thermal, the R rating of the foam goes down. So, uh, you know, changes happen over time. So, I've seen foam powderize. It's very weird. Um, a lot of it has to do with the additives that are in the foam, the colors. Uh, what material do you recommend to go directly over touching the surface of acrylic paintings before packing? Um, so, in unframed paintings, uh, I would generally say that you shouldn't touch the face of the painting with any material. You would want to use like a shadow box or a travel frame if it's unframed. If it's framed uh, but unglazed, uh, same thing. But if you do have to touch the face of a painting, I mean, it's, it's really not something that I would suggest. Um, so I would suggest doing a shadow box and then wrapping that. Um, but Dartec is a, a good material for that, I think. Uh, you know, you want to make sure that that material is not touching on the face of the piece because it, you know, you could have, uh, it could adhere. And one thing I want to say really quick, it's from probably one of the uh, worst, some of the worst damage I've seen from people wrapping paintings is when people use glassine to wrap paintings. Glassine will adhere to the face of the painting, and uh, it happens really quickly. So don't wrap any painting in glassine. Uh, it, it's uh, just a, the raw material for that. It was you know, originally made to be uh, for paperwork to act as interleaving material in between paperwork, um, and it really shouldn't be used for anything else. Uh, a shadow box the same thing as coloring? Yes. A shadow box is the same thing as coloring. But, and that's, a, that's one of the things that I'm going to just suggest really quickly is that when you're working with your crater or with another institution and you're talking about your crating specifications or your packing specifications, be aware that uh, vocabulary is inconsistent throughout the industry. And so you should really describe what you're talking about really uh, work to establish a common vocabulary with the people you're working with because there can be a lot of misunderstandings that arise over somebody's definition of a box, for example, or a crate. Um, you know, some people, we, like for example, we call the boxes that go inside of crates, we call those inner boxes. Some people call those inner crates. Uh, you know, it, it can be a point of real confusion and um, sometimes, like, some bad mistakes can happen when, you know, the wrong kind of component gets built. And again, we have a small little video of shadow box being created, our coloring being created. Um, it can give you some ideas on possibly how to construct something like that. And uh, also there for download is a, a little handout that uh, we put together, and it has a lot of the information that are on the slides, uh, and it goes over a couple of other things, but all of the uh, definitions that we talked about in terms of what certain types of packing are are in that uh, handout. So I would suggest if you're interested in kind of going over it, uh, you know, print that out, take a look at it. Okay. Um, there's just two quick questions. I Please fill out the evaluations. I will um, uh, consult with Meg and Lisa, and we can put together a supply list that I'll post with the handouts and the recording and the PowerPoint slides, and that will be done in the next few days. Um, Mary Costa asked, do you have patterns for shadow boxes and trays to share? And um, yeah, I think take a look at the videos, right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I don't have specific uh, patterns to share, but uh, it's pretty simple. I can, I have a handout, actually, that I made 
couple years ago for a very, it was called Getting Basic With Your Art, which was a, it was a workshop for artists to teach artists how to pack their art not so terribly because artists are notoriously awful at packing their art and they do things with no sense so. None taken. Uh, I actually make art to be packed <laughs> now. I would like, if I have a, a crate that I can refurbish, I'll make the art to fit in the crate. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, like, uh, I, I'll, I'll provide that link for Susan and she can maybe put it up, but it has a, a little description of how to make a shadow box in terms of how to construct it. Um, Great. I see also here uh, wait, wait. silicon release. Silica, a question. Yeah, so silicon release. Really yeah, I have uh, I have worked with it. Um, you know, oh, generally where I've used it is when you're packing something that maybe is still the media is still active, like a painting. Um, but it's also good for oil. You know, like a oil drawings. When people use oil sticks. Uh, the thing with silicon release paper, it, uh, and any time, if you did have to put, uh, like for example, if you did have to put an acrylic painting uh, and you had to wrap it directly, you might want to put silicon release paper around it because the silicon release paper will not stick to it. Um, you have to get special tape for silicon release paper or you have to just basically pressure wrap it so that you're not, um, you know, maybe wrap around the silicone release paper with, paper, uh, with plastic or Dartec to hold it in place because nothing sticks to silicone release paper except the special tape that's very expensive. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that's it. Great. Um, thank you both so right. much. This is a great way to close out the year. And we hope that everybody has nice holidays and check the website because the the schedule is ever changing right now, so uh, be attentive to that, and we'll see you in the new year. Thank you, Lisa and Meg. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Susan. Thank, Thank you, Mike. You.